Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the West Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Authority full authority meeting this morning. Apologies if there's any members of the public uh, that have been waiting. We've had some technical difficulties, some and some connectivity, uh, but we think we've got um, um, those here that we expected to be here. Um, my councillors, um, I'm asking everybody just to mute their microphones um, for those members of the public that have never uh, logged into one of these meetings before the uh, Shorshire Fire Authority um, the voices and the names that you'll see are the authority members from uh, the five councils of West Yorkshire well, I'm in now yeah, I'm in. Many thanks um, yeah, thank you So I will just come in there and welcome Councillor Graham. Thank you for joining us, Councillor Graham. If you could just mute your microphone. And as always, we will use the raise of the hand or the chat bar if you wish to speak or ask a question, uh, particularly if there's any um, IT difficulties, we'll, we'll, we'll try and make our way through them. Um, so I will just go through the list of Members that we have present. Sorry, do, do you do you want do you want members to intimate with yes if they are here, or just want to go through the list? Um, I'm happy that I've got who's here. It's if you want to double check, you could read the names out. Okay, we'll do it. Bit of a register then. Just say yes if you're here. If you're not here, you don't say anything. Um, so I'll just go for um, elected members, obviously for purposes of the public, there are a number of uh, officers of my Shorty Five here as well on this call, um, but I'll try to take them in more than short. So we've got Councillor Tate. Yes, Chair. Thank you. We've got Councillor Anderson. Yes, Chair. Councillor Wenham. Yes, Chair. We've got Councillor Hall. Yes, Chair. Councillor Jenkins. Yes, Chair. Councillor Armas. Good morning. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Pollard. Good morning. Thank you, Councillor Curtin. Thank you, Councillor Harrand. I'm here. Thank you, Councillor Graham. Councillor Graham. I'm okay. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Downs. Yep, still here. Thank you. Now, this is where I'm going to have to be a bit, uh, I'm going to have to use the powers of my memory because that's the list as I see on the right. Uh, but we also have Councillor Pavis. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Councillor Mohammed. Yes, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Fenton Glynn. Yes, Chair. Sorry, I switched on mute there. Thank you. Councillor Tully. Yes, I'm here, yeah. Councillor Shaheen. Yes, Chair. And Councillor Sunderland. Yes, Chair. Now, as far as I can see, that is the, unless there's an elected member here whose name I haven't called, but I think I've called every name. Chair, 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 Chair. Councillor Hunt. Councillor Hunt, sorry. Councillor Hunt. Yep. Gotcha. Should have remembered. Okay, so that's the membership the members of this committee. Uh, we'll go into the uh, agenda. So item one is 
Um, any answers for me? I think we just made those around just the uh, housekeeping. Today's meeting. Um, item number two, obviously, the public. Everything on this agenda is for public consumption. Um, item number three, there are no urgent items here today. Uh, any declarations of interest from any members related to any agenda item? No, then we'll go to item number five. The minutes of the meeting held on the 25th to approve. I'm, I'm happy to move. I'm happy to move. Moved, I'm happy to second. Thank you. I'm happy to second. And we'll take the consensus that those are okay unless anybody wishes to put a note against that. Let's have a look. Uh, and item number six, then any matters arising for those minutes of the meeting on the 25th of June? Members? Thank you. So I've just been passed a note. Councillor Renshaw is having technical difficulties. She's trying to log in. She has been for a little while. Jig, can, have you, are you able to contact Councillor Renshaw? Is yeah, it... I have. Yeah, I'm in process. Yeah, thank you. So matters arising from those minutes. And then at item number seven, we've got the minutes of committees held of the authority since the 25th of June and any other relevant outside bodies. Uh, enclosed on page number seven. Those are voting. Councillor Anderson. Is it appropriate to comment on the HR minutes at the moment, Chair? I'm not sure how you're running the running order of the minutes of meetings. Yeah, I was just going to take them. Okay, so you, you've got to comment on the minutes of the HR meeting. Yeah, just um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. in relation to the pension scheme dispute, um, part nine of those minutes, the last line says it was hoped the government will pick up the additional costs. Um, how hopeful is hoped? <laughs> what, what's the balance of um, the likelihood of that? I'll send you one. Chair, it's probably best I, I respond to that, Ian Bradwood, if that's okay. Um, at, 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 at the moment, we're still awaiting the final guidance from the government. So, um, as, as far as we know, we, we, we're hoping that there will be no additional cost for the authority, but we, we, we can't give members any assurance at this stage until we see the final guidance is set out. Thanks, Chair. Okay, um, Councillor Jenkins. Yes, I'd like to raise um, an item under on page 16, item six of the Community Safety Committee. Um, in the meeting, I asked if there could be a report on chip pan fires. And uh, there's no criticism. It's just uh, it'd be useful to have one because I think it's quite significant in terms of um, the effect it has, particularly in high-rise blocks, if there is a chip pan fire, and what preventative measures we can take. Thank you. Chair, it's Dave Walton. Can I comment on that one? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, th th that request is noted. Uh, Scott Donegan has been working on that one. Um, I think the intention is that we're bringing that to Community Safety Committee. Scott, is that correct? I know you're, you're in the big room. Yeah, we'll be bringing that to the next Community Safety Committee in October. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just check my list. I'll just welcome Councillor Renshaw to the meeting. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've been sat in the lobby waiting to be allowed in for 20 minutes. So thankfully, somebody ran across just now to get me into the meeting. Agreed. Yeah, we've had a number of technical issues this morning from lobby to connectivity to audio, so I'm glad you're here. Um, Thank you very much. 
So we're just on item number seven. Um, yeah. Minutes of the committee to Elton for 25th of June. Um, yeah, good questions from Councillor Hanson. Um, we absolutely do need that injection of, uh, of funds going forwards to cover to cover those pensions. And Councillor, um, yeah, it's quite right to raise. That. I mean, when you read some of the incident reports, you do you see more. Not that there's a staggering number, but you do see more chip vampires than you would imagine uh, that there might be. I think we've all maybe <laughs> you would just assume that that's a piece of equipment that they won't necessarily use very much anymore, but clearly people do, and clearly that there is still a risk, obviously, to, to, to doing that. So it'd be interesting to see what you know to, to quantify uh, that particular topic. Uh, Alison, you've raised your hand, Alison Wood. Yeah, um, just in response to Councillor Anderson, so the additional cost re relating to the pensions dispute that is actually part of the spending review submission that the, the um we've made to the treasury so hopefully that will be included in the next spending review um which we which will start from april next year yeah. thank you uh, can bring Pollard. thank you chair uh on the finance and resources committee um it's page 22 of the document pack uh just do with a little bit of information of how much of the COVID-19 grant funding of just over two million uh, is currently still available to spend. And in the last paragraph at the bottom of page 22, uh, last sentence reads, advice has been received from government with regard to the availability of some grant funding to cover loss of income, and it was anticipated that West Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Service expect receipt of such monies. Have we had any clue as to what the formula is for that? Uh, it may be similar to local authorities, authorities uh, but some, some indication. Thank you, Alison, do you want to come in? Yeah, so um, Councillor Pollard, we've got around, we spent about half a million so far, the 2.17 million. Regarding the income support, um, the government will actually refund us the same as what they are local authorities. So, 75p in every pound of income lost. Um, we are collating some data, um, and our first submission will be at the end of September. So, yes, we can claim just as local authorities can claim. So, we're putting a claim in certain income that we know we've lost. So, for youth training schemes, we know they've lost income there and training courses too. So, yes, we will be making a claim. Is that okay, Councillor Pollard? Yeah, that's fine. Sorry, it, uh, that was a bit of a blip. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, those yeah. that have raised their hand on that section, then if you could just lower your hand. Uh, uh, I don't see any other raised hands or any other questions, so thank you for that. Uh, item eight then, is the performance management reports. Um, the COVID delayed report from April 19 to March 20, and then the first quarter of this year, uh, also in full from page 33. Um, yeah, yes, I'm sure. I think Alison just wants to introduce this item and, and then I'll take you through the detail. Okay, thank you. Thank you, yes. So this paper, there are reports. One is for the full year from the 1st of April 2019 to the 31st of March 2020. Uh, the reason why it was delayed is presented was due to COVID, but the report was available to all members, if all members have seen this. And this is for the first of the first of April to the thirtieth of June. And they brought those Alison, Alison, can I just stop you there? Your microphone for some reason is quite muffled. I don't know whether you can speak a little louder or whether there's something interrupting the audio on your microphone. Now. Yeah, that's clearer, but maybe if you just speak a little louder as well, it's certainly clearer. Yeah. So the paper has two reports attached to it. One is for the full year from the 1st of April 19 to the 31st of March 2020. And the second report is for the first quarter of the current year. 
Uh, Dave Walton will go through the detail within the report and will provide more up-to-date information of where we are at present. So I'll pass over to Dave. Thank you, Alison. Um, so as Alison has alluded to, the meeting pack itself includes, uh, includes two performance management reports, one the first quarter of this reporting year, and the other is the end of year summary for 1920, which we couldn't present due to meeting revisions as a consequence of COVID. Um, the end of year summary itself was presented to and has been scrutinised by the Community Safety Committee on the 24th of July. Um, and members have also been provided with a live version of this year's performance to date via email. Uh, this version was taken from our system on Wednesday morning of this week. Um, and I will also share that onto screen now. So hopefully everybody can see that. Yeah, I'm seeing some not. OK, so I'm, I'm going to talk about that one as it sits in front of me now. Um, so in the interest of management time, I'm going to provide you the narrative summary of this version um, and some comments on that first quarter summary um, where it's not included in the shared document and then happily take questions on, on all of them at the end as well. So as per the email I sent you, I do need to make it clear to you that by taking this report live off the system uh, earlier this week, there is a small possibility that some of the numbers may move slightly as we deal with data quality issues and, and, and some uh, late reporting, but it shouldn't materially change either direction of travel um, or, or any of the, the, the broad figures there as well. Uh, so firstly, I've got to say in common with so many issues of this year, this is a challenging year by any measure. Um, and as such, I present these figures with the caveat that it's probably not appropriate to make a direct comparison with other years or similar periods of other years because th things are happening differently, which I shall now talk about with you. Um, I think one of the key messages that comes out from this um, document is, is that whilst overall levels of activity are broadly similar, um, what we're seeing is a shift in proportion of the incident types uh, that, that they're moving around within that overall number which make up the total. Uh, early data does suggest that this is broadly in keeping what other crime rescue services are also seeing during this period as well. I think that the obvious one that jumps out at you um, it is the total number of road traffic collisions. Uh, that would be this one here, if you can see my screen, uh, which is reduced by something in the order of 42%. Um, now, now it's, it's, it's obvious to think what that's about, and it's difficult to find an accurate figure on the drop in actual road traffic um, as a consequence of lockdown. But a BBC report that I did look at suggests that in May, um, figures were about 35 to 45% of normal levels, which, which supports the figure that we're seeing, um, and therefore this reduction itself is unsurprising. Uh, the other striking figure is this one here, uh, and that's the prevalence of false alarms. Uh, that's striking particularly in terms of the quantum, um, because that does involve some quite big numbers. Uh, this is readily explainable by the change in policy which we implemented in the, in the early phases of the outbreak. Uh, members will recall that we have an existing policy which you have approved to not attend calls to automatic fire alarms in many types of public or commercial premise during the daytime on the understanding uh, that the property is occupied and that there is an ability to check with the property directly before we mobilise fire engines to what on the vast majority of occasions turns out to be a false alarm. Uh, given that lockdown meant so many properties were closed at times when we would ordinarily expect them to be open, uh, we took a decision to reinstate a blanket attendance policy, uh, and that drives those numbers there. We're now back to something approaching normal, although we will keep this under review. Uh, I do think as well it's worth pointing out, and this serves to remind us, that the decision the authority took to support that policy round in reducing our attendance to automatic fire alarms has had the impact of removing a huge number of unnecessary blue light journeys from our call demand, and it does keep crews free for genuine emergencies and other tasks as well. Uh, there's also a reduction in the numbers that you're looking at in the number of non-domestic building, fire, uh, building fires, and that's attributable, um, we think, to the lack of use and occupancy. Uh, we do note that the arson figure in respect of secondary fires is up. Uh, very slightly. Unsurprising given that schools have been off for so long and that the weather was relatively good for many parts of the lockdown. Um, all issues we've talked with members before. Uh, if I'm honest, I think this could have been worse under the circumstances. Uh, I'd, I'd like to think that the intense campaigning that we did had a positive effect 
um, although it's always, always difficult to prove what didn't happen, but we did a lot of proactive work on that one. Uh, and I would also say at this stage as well that secondary fire arson generally smooths out as the year progresses, um, but we are planning at the moment for what we think can be a very different type of uh, bonfire night. Uh, given that many, if not all, of the large organised displays in the region will be unable to take place. Uh, we anticipate an increase in prevalence of bonfires in local settings, such as gardens and open spaces, and an increase in use of fireworks by people who are unfamiliar with fireworks safety, given that for many recent years they've paid somebody else to set them off for them. Uh, this presents an increased risk and demand for ourselves, and we are already in a dialogue with partners such as the police and the National Health Service about how we're going to approach this differently this year. Uh, there is a reduction in the number of building fires and a reduction in the number of fire-related injuries. Uh, this gives some reassurance that home safety has been good throughout, but there is no room for complacency, particularly as we move into darker, colder nights and the need to stop indoors increases. Uh, I think the net effect of this, as members will have uh, surmise for themselves is that we have seen a small overall increase in total activity uh, but that is largely due to the quantum of the increase in attendance what do ultimately turn out to be false alarms. Um, I'll take the share screen down now just before I finish um, this uh, presentation. So th there's a couple of other issues I, I know members are particularly interested in the attacks on firefighters and the violence at work issues. Um, we have some updates for you um, following some of the recent attacks on our staff. Uh, one on the 3rd of May in 2020, where a male member of the public started acting verbally towards the crews and then pulled a makeshift weapon. Uh, subsequently, that individual has been convicted with a 52 weeks imprisonment. Um, we also uh, have um, one that went on in Kirklees in August, where a Dewsbury fire station crew uh, witnessed a, a fairly vicious and violent attack uh, involving members of the public. Um, we have been working with the police um, re regarding some CT CCTV footage that we had and also dealing with some of the issues that presented to our crews as a consequence of, of, of witnessing that attack as well. And the final one I'll talk about is one in Wakefield. Uh, it, was, it was actually in Featherston on June 2020. Uh, an individual by the name of Mr Craig Machen appeared at Leeds District Magistrates on 7th of August and was charged with assault by beating of an emergency worker on two counts. Uh, he pleaded guilty to the offence, the uh, case was concluded, um, the outcome being that the individual was ordered to pay a £456 fine and £50 compensation to each of the four members of that crew as well. Um, I'm going to make no other comment um, on the performance management other than the fact that the number of safe and well visits are starting to increase as we started to move out of full lockdown as are the numbers of operational risk visits. Uh, we are mindful, given what's going on around us at the moment, though, that we may need to revert this policy um, as we move back towards some degree of lockdown or restriction on movement. Uh, we keep our eye on that. Uh, and in my final closing, I'll just remind members that throughout this period, we haven't missed a single 999 call. Um, we have dealt with all of the requests for safe and well activity and for fire protection advice around the safety of buildings on a risk assessed basis and we will continue to do so uh, within the confines of what is both safe, legal and achievable for us. I'm very happy to take questions on that but before I do that I'm just going to ask Ian Bramwood to update you on the COVID related sickness because I know members have a particular interest on that and then we'll take questions generally if that's okay. Chair, Chair, just briefly, um, I'll, I'll give an overview, but split the overview into two parts. I'll talk very briefly about the impact of COVID between March 1st and August 31st, which seemed to be the first phase of the pandemic as far as we're concerned. And then I'll give a very brief update of where we are today. Um, between March the 1st and August 31st, in total, we lost, we lost 660 working days or shift to COVID-19 sickness. Um, the worst month that we were affected was April, where we lost 355 working days or shift, shifts. Um, in total, 112 of our staff tested positive for COVID. Through the peak of the pandemic during April and May, we had an average of 72 staff absent each day, but that included those that were self-isolating, with the highest number of absentees in a single day totaling 120. <laughs> In terms of self-isolation or shielding, there were further staff who were absent from work either due to shielding, this is those people who were clinically vulnerable and were advised to remain at home, or other staff self-isolating for short periods due to coming into contact with someone with COVID. In total, between March and August, 
2,419 working days or shifts were lost. Absence was only recorded in respect of those staff unable to undertake their duties from home. So clearly members will understand that we had a significant number of support service staff who were able to undertake predominantly their normal work from a remote location. In total, 206 staff were subjected to a period of self-isolation. Of those, approximately 26 were shielding, and they, was, they were, were therefore absent from work for most of the period between April and the beginning of August. In terms of the current situation, the situation is changing on almost a daily basis, but as of this morning, the situation is that we currently have eight people absent from work who have tested positive for COVID and 15 people who are self-isolating as a consequence of coming into contact with someone with COVID. I think in closing the chair, all I would do is reiterate um, Dave Walton's comments and say that despite high levels of absence over this period, contingency plan worked effectively and fire cover and all essential support services continued to be delivered. Uh, plans were put in place collaboratively with our trade unions, and as Dave has said, these have been refined to ensure business continuity through any potential second wave of the virus. Like Dave, I'm happy to answer any questions, Chair. Thanks, Ian. Uh, members, uh, Councillor Pollard. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just uh, one comment and one question, really. Um, obviously, the, the the data this time is is heavily skewed by COVID, and it strikes me that obviously, as we're as we're looking at comparators going forward uh, on three year average bases, um, a lot of our data in the future is going to be very skewed by by the COVID period, and you, and I do wonder slightly whether or not we're going to have to do some sort of rejig on this, uh, taking out some of these short-term factors and, and smoothing it. Otherwise, your rag rating stuff is going to be corrupted probably beyond the point of usefulness, in a sense. Um, th and then just one query on page 72 um, regarding the... Um, incidents, the, the six plus pumps incidents. Uh, I wouldn't want to do anything uh, to give any clues to any uh, COVID conspiracy nutcases, but but six pumps for a telecommunications mast fire, the 5G mast, um, was it that there was stuff around the mast that also caught fire as a result, which necessitated six pumps? It does look rather a lot for a mast. Thank you, Chair, Thank you, Chair. If, 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 and I'll take that on. Uh, firstly, regarding the comments, yes, we, we, we're absolutely mindful of the fact that we have some, we'll, we'll refer to it as skewed data within this year, um, and we are going to have to have a careful think about how we do this, other than that we, we sit talking for the next three years about this period with an asterisk next to it, but I, I'd like to find a better way around it than that. Um, secondly, turning to the incident on the 16th of April, uh, Bradley and Huddersfield, um, what the, the, the document doesn't describe, uh, uh, and some members may have seen this because it got quite extensive media coverage, uh, the mast itself was actually uh, bolted to the side of a four or five storey mill building uh, and spread from top to bottom. Um, so the, 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 the attendance reflects the fact that it was bolted onto the side of what is a domestic building um, and by all accounts was uh, burning rather fiercely when we arrived. Right, that, that, that does explain it, thank you. Thank you, yeah. Councillor Hunt. Uh, yeah, qu a question uh, for Dave, please. I mean, any t any type of attack on members of the authority uh, is, is is awful, and I, I guess some of those attacks could be verbal, and some may be physical. Yeah, that's um, correct. Yeah. Can, can we be assured that in the case of the physical attacks that, um, you know, that, that the, the, the staff's well-being is, 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 you know, has been taken care of? 
Uh, yes, you can, you can be completely assured of, of that, members. Um, we, we have a, a robust welfare process in place, um, as and when we become aware of each and every one of those attacks which are reported through a central reporting line. Uh, if it hasn't already risen at the moment of attack, um, a, a flexible duty officer, a middle manager will be notified, usually somebody within the district affected, who will speak to the crew and individual um, affected by the attack, either providing some verbal report, uh, support and reassurance and or if we need to, referring further into the brigade's welfare support services, if that's the case. Okay, thank you for that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Adam, did I see your hand go up there? Me, yes, please. Can we be... I think we can assume nobody's been prosecuted for the telecommunications mass. Have they? Have we here um, or anywhere else? Not as far as I'm aware, Councillor Harron, but, but we haven't been intimately linked within the on, ongoing investigation. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions um, for that? Um, go without saying this past. Six months have been, what would you call it, challenging, tricky, difficult um, for everybody, um, no more so than you are officers that have responded and reconfigured and coped um, and responded with this level of resilience so well. Um, I wrote to our um, staff by the online the electronic magazine and offered thanks on behalf of the authority and it was okay to do that um, to, because I think it's important that we do recognise staff and we do thank everybody from top to bottom for, for everything they've they've done through this because it, um, you know the old thing of no, nobody's really working from home people are at home and they're attempting to work um, and you know um, people are working and they are still to some degree afraid and unsure um, of um, of the situation and the situations that they're entering in. So I think the fact that we've kept our fire stations open, and our, you know, our surface is up there and our firefighters in post, I think has been, has been a fantastic effort from everybody. And just the way that our staff have supported communities around West Yorkshire, pharmacy visits, PPE deliveries, uh, food bank donations. Uh, I think we've shown that we really are a responsive and resilient group of people uh, that when the chips are down, we can, we can respond. So, yeah, thank you for, for, for that, everybody. Thank you, members, for your contributions. I'll now move on to item number nine, which is the IRNP uh, 2122 outcome of the consultation on page 81. Uh, Nick, is it over to you? Yes, it is. Thank you. Yes, it is. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, members, this, this report is for noting, um, and it does uh, involve the item 10 on the agenda, which is the business case which is uh, being presented uh, following this report. Um, the authority gave approval to carry out an eight week consultation on the 26th of June um, regarding the proposal to relocate the fire station currently based at Fleck Eaton uh, on High Town Road uh, to our fire service headquarters at Birkenshaw. That consultation was delivered in line with the Government Principles 2018 and it closed on the 21st of August uh, this year. So I've said that the report gives an overview of the activity and the, the main areas of feedback that we have received. Uh, and it's fair to say we just had a discussion there around COVID. This consultation exercise has been different to any other that we have delivered uh, in previous years. However, it's also fair to say that's required us to do things differently. And we've had a degree of success in carrying out that consultation uh, under such circumstances as well. So we did consider the impact of COVID and that required us to have a, a greater online presence throughout the consultation, including the, the main social media platforms, uh, as well as Facebook Live. So that's similar to the session we're doing now where uh, myself and other officers uh, hosted sessions with the public. Uh, and as well as paid for adverts through Facebook and other uh, online media uh, to bring it to the attention of, of local residents. Um, we also met local uh, councillors and uh, a, the local community outcome group over Microsoft Teams. 
And we sent letters to key stakeholders within the council and the other emergency services. And in turn, we met with the stations affected, uh, specifically Cleckheaton and the four watches down at Cleckheaton, as well as with the representative bodies um, and discussed the proposal with them. Generally, with staff, we communicated the proposal by podcast and also with uh, during our, our brigade wide staff briefing sessions. So, all in all, we were very pleased with the level of engagement that we uh, received. Um, to put it to some sort of context, we got over 230 responses to our online survey. Uh, that's one of the sort of highest levels that we've had in recent years to an IMP proposal. Uh, last year, we got just over 300 responses. Uh, but there were five proposals within that integrated risk management plan uh, affecting the whole of West Yorkshire. Uh, so we're confident that we did manage to target uh, the consultation of the right uh, people within the community. So in terms of the, the feedback that we've received, uh, as I said there, we had 233 people complete our online survey. In total, 53% of those were opposed to the proposal. Uh, and section 5 de deals with the, the main uh, points of concern from those uh, fed back to us by the, by the survey and our Facebook Live sessions. So I'll just work through those and then um, we'll be able to take any questions uh, at the end. So the main the main point of cons concern was increased response times that will be seen within the Clackheaton uh, area and surrounding areas. <coughs> So it's fair to say we've never uh, said that the communities wouldn't be impacted. So some communities will see an increase in their response times. However, these the, the worst uh, affected community will see an increase of four minutes and 12 seconds, bringing their response time to a total of seven minutes, 36. Now, members will be familiar with our risk-based planning assumptions. So the response into that community, which we class as being low risk of fire, is still well within our risk based plan assumptions and equal to the level of response that we uh, provide to high risk areas and fire. Other concerns were that there's been a number of previous mergers or since 2010 uh, in and around uh, the Cleckheaton area affecting the overall fire cover. Um, each time we produce an integrated risk management plan to look at fire cover, it considers uh, those previous um, proposals and changes uh, and we build our business case based on the fire cover at, that, at this moment in time. So the modelling that we've done in terms of response standards uh, consider the previous fire station closures and measures that have taken place in and around the Cleckheaton area. The third sort of main, main uh, point was the increased response times to the motorway network. So this has generated quite a lot of uh, interest uh, in terms of the feedback. Um, the, the business case highlights the fact that Cleckheaton also, as well as its fire appliance, um, it, it delivers a service that we call the technical rescue unit, which is a county-wide service that needs to have good access to the motorway network. We look very closely at the access that can be provided um, from the existing Clackheaton station and from the Birkinshaw sites. And it's fair to say that the, the access from Birkinshaw to the wider network is still very good uh, and improved, net, uh, improved access compared to Clackheaton. There are small sections of the motorway where we'll see a, a marginal reduction in our response time, uh, but professionally, we don't feel like there's anything to be concerned of. Um, we can go into more detail in, in terms of in terms of that. There's also a misconception in the consultation feedback that the proposal is all about saving money. So, although in, in previous years we had to restructure our fire cover uh, to balance our budgets, uh, this, this proposal does save money. It saves a significant amount of money, uh, 1.6 million in terms of the build cost of the station. That isn't the primary factor. The primary factor is the uh, distribution of fire cover and our overall response on the basis of risk across West Yorkshire. But having said that, we can, we've got a duty to demonstrate best value and we feel that this proposal uh, does demonstrate that. In fact, yes, it does save uh, a significant amount of money. The other main point of uh, feedback was the 
uh, loss of the community asset in Cleck Eaton. So rightly so, the communities within Cleck Eaton are proud to have a fire station within their towns, been there a lot of years, it's our oldest fire station. Um, but unlike some other services that are delivered by public, uh, the public sector, the fire services are a service that go to the public so all our services are mobile, so the, the prevention uh, is delivered within the homes and within the schools. Uh, our protection goes out into the local businesses and obviously our response attends uh, by. So we're confident that the, the level of service that the people of Clecking will, will receive will be consistent with what they've received in the past. They'll continue to receive uh, the full um, services from ourselves. In terms of access to the fire station, um, we will, if, if approved, uh, build a community room within the new station at Birkenshaw and we will provide access to the community and that will be open to all the communities within the Spen Valley uh, as well as Clark Eaton. There's also a, a degree of uh, concern around the impact of a fire station on our headquarters site on the local road network in Birkenshaw. Um, it's fair to say that Headquarters itself is already an operational location. We do see fire appliances uh, responding from this location as well as training out of this location. Um, we feel that, that that impact on the local road network will be marginal uh, and our firefighters are trained to drive to a very high standard and uh, will we'll consider the, the local uh, road network and soon get to understand that when they're turning out from here. Uh, so all in all, uh, they're the, the, the main points of uh, feedback during the consultation. Um, we do feel it's been a successful exercise. Um, it's, it's fair to say that over the eight weeks, the feedback's been consistent from the very start to the finish around those, those main points. Um, we have considered the majority of that feedback when we compiled the business case initially. And, and therefore we feel that there's nothing significant that's been fed back to us that requires us to uh, amend the business case that's going to be presented to you uh, in item 10. So at that point I'll take any questions on the consultation or feedback uh, that we've received, Chair. Okay, thank you. Just a piece of housekeeping. Can I just remind members just to turn off their cameras unless they're speaking? I think there are some visual issues on uh, YouTube at the moment, and I don't think everybody's got access. But yeah, members can turn off their microphones. Uh, we'll just turn and their and their uh, mic unless they are unless they are speaking. Um, that's if I could then, because uh, there is item ten, which is the final proposal. So if I could just invite questions um, around the outcome of. The consultation, questions about the method of consultation or anything like that. And if I could just, um, so we have a consultation with the three ward councils for Cleckheaton. Um, they did email me uh, last night. Uh, I, I take some confidence what you've said there, Nick, around traffic and response times. Um, I just wonder whether you could clarify um, just a couple of points before we uh, move further then around. Um, any any exemption that because uh, it was one of the fears that that, that the technocracy might have been exempt from uh, these kind of decisions at, at some point in time. And if you could just clarify that for us, um, and if you could clarify for us, um, in response times um, coming down the A58 towards Chamber compared to um, coming from Clickheaton along. Along Bradford Road, because those were two of their concerns that I'm not sure you covered in your in your bit there. I think we covered everything else. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Chair. So, in terms of the uh, so-called exemption that's been reported uh, for Cleck Eaton, I think it, it is fair to say that some of the capabilities delivered out of Cleck Eaton, as I've mentioned, are county-wide. Um, so, we've got the technical rescue unit. They also host the urban search and rescue unit, which is a national capability. So in terms of those capabilities, they are, they are significant in terms of our overall uh, response capability for the county. And it's fair to say that we would want to see uh, those impacted uh, or reduced. Um, 
this proposal, as, as I've made clear, we can uh, cover that a little bit more in item 10, uh, does not propose to uh, re remove those capabilities, nor does it propose to reduce the number of fire, fire appliances that we've got, or the, the staff working at Cleckheaton and, and their skills. So the same staff, the same skills, operating the same appliances, uh, but they'll be uh, delivered from the Berkeley Shore side of the pool rather than the Cleckheaton side. So we wouldn't see any impact on on that. Okay, I'm going to bring in Councillor Sunderland. Good morning. Um, just a quick question on the FBU's um, uh, responses. They're raising difficulties of building the fire station whilst the training centre, the, the headquarters and the training centre is also being redeveloped. Do we have a comment on that, please? Yeah, so if, if approved, the um, the planning and implementation of a, a new station at headquarters and a redevelopment of the site will obviously take some detailed detailed planning um, on the point of your project methodology alongside that. Um, clearly, people understand the site. It is a large site that we've got. We have here marked a corner of the site, which uh, passes onto the Whitehall Road. Uh, there will be a secure colored fire station that will not be disrupted. Um, so, obviously, our priority will be to maintain the operational levels of that fire station and we'll build uh, and, and plan around that corner. And, uh, so, we're confident with the size of the site and we can deliver training and, and, uh, and build a new fire station that we can facilitate that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I've uh, got Councillor Wynnum. Oh, sorry, sorry about that. Um, my my concern is um, there's one good thing that come out of it. When relocation normally takes place, the normally loss of jobs. But with this one, the fire don't. There's no reduction in the operation staff and no reduction in the fire engines, which is good news for us. Thank you. Uh, I'll go to Councillor Pollard. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just referring again to the uh, to the feedback I think we all got from uh, the Cleckheaton Ward councillors. Uh, just one little aspect in their submission, which I'd like a little bit further information on, regarding specifically the the technical rescue unit, and obviously. A fair bit of their work, I suppose, will be M62 related. Uh, and the councillors mention the the sort of cunning plan route onto the motorway uh, through the, the service station at Hart's Head. Um, clearly, it, it may well be the case that in the, in the instance of a serious accident, chain bar access roundabout may well be clogged anyway. Uh, and I was wondering if there was a significant detriment to speed response onto the motorway by which of the fact that presumably that Hearts Head and War Service Station route uh, will will no longer be available essentially. Yeah, okay, so just to, to take that, the question with regards to the technical rescue unit is a county wide asset and it does uh, access to the motorway, but uh, it's access to the whole of the uh, major road network and uh, major conurbations around West Yorkshire that are important as well. So we do feel that it's going to be improved by having the opportunity to access it 26 and 27. There is a, a cut through asset services that the uh, station of Cleckheaton can currently use. And just to put that into context uh, for members, that stretch of motorway between junction 26 and 25 is approximately uh, four miles. And the access that they can, they can take uh, through the services gives them uh, access to a mile on that motorway between uh, the services in Junction 25 and the West Island carriage only. Mm. Um, the increased attendance time that they see by using that cut through compared to an appliance attending from, from Birkenshaw is, is only around 20 seconds quicker than the appliance attending from Birkenshaw. So it's very marginal. 
is the, is the uh, improvement that that gives, and it's to a very small section of motorway. Um, so I think we've had uh, 363 um, executions on the motorway over the last two years. Five have taken place between 25 and 26, and only two of those have been westbound. And we're talking about 20 second difference. And for those people that uh, you don't need to be an operational bike lines driver to recognize that 20 seconds is a difference between uh, a couple of lights turning uh, against you or uh, the, the vehicle moving out or local traffic congestion. Um, so 20 seconds is very marginal in, in terms of that, that difference. Operational, we have a number of uh, different procedures in place. So you, you're aware the motor M62 is the managed motorway. So we've got very tight procedures with uh, highways in England and uh, the police in terms of access to that. So we make sure that appliances are sent uh, to opposite junctions to where the, the uh, incident is reported. And then we've got procedures then to access contra flow uh, should we need it as well. So if there's condition on that motorway, uh, it's very likely that the uh, first responding appliances may be coming contra flow uh, from 25 or 24. Uh, so they may be Huddersfield and Raspberry coming on the motorway. So in terms of our overall response, it is quite tight and well practiced, and we do make sure that we have a dual approach to minimise the disruption that we can see in terms of the traffic congestion. Thanks for that. That clarifies that well. Thank you. Thank you. If I could go to Councillor Tully. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Nick's just actually answered part of the question, but the question was about this outside more road. I'm not that familiar with that part of the road, but I can only assume the question was, does this that road into outside more providers both east and west carriageways? And I get the impression what Nick just said it does. I think it just gives us a small road on the, on the, on the westbound carriageway. Um, and I'm not sure I've ever found in any documentation that the technically only based at Clegeaton was one of the reasons why it was always been exempt from closure. And I think that's well been covered as well. I don't think any station is ever exempt from closure. We look at all the, it's what's wise, but I'm not sure will they get this information from that the station. And to put a finer point in it, Chair, we ain't closing it, we're relocating it. And I think all the uh, information that's been provided within the conversation as uh, as give us adequate information as to why it can be relocated without creating as many difficulties going forward. Chair, yeah, we come in there. Yeah, Chair, can I just ask members uh, to turn off their cameras, please, because we're having trouble with the live feed for members of the public who are watching the meeting. So if uh, if we can just remain with our camera on and you as the chair, then that'll just uh, make the situation better for people who are viewing online. Okay, that's fine. Clearly still an issue with the visual. So yes, members, please do turn off your cameras and, your, and mute your microphones until the time comes where you wish to speak. Um, yeah, is Councillor Nick, is Councillor Tully right there around this exemption from closure? I, I've never believed that any station would be um, exempt in any way from closure or any relocation as such. Yeah, Councillor Tully is, is correct there. We, we, we can't possibly do that because uh, we need to deliver a, a service based on the funding that we receive uh, proportionate to risk and that as we've seen since 2010 has required us to, to close and relocate fire stations. I think what we have said recently is we will endeavour to maintain uh, 40 fire stations and 46 frontline appliances and this delivers that uh, commitment. Thank you. Uh, so can, I, can I just come back and just clarify the situation again, just for my own, about the access to outside mode? Does it just cover, as Nick had said, the one carriageway and rather than, rather than it give an opportunity to access the motorway from both directions? Yes, that's correct, uh, Councillor Tully. Yeah, it's, it's westbound and it's only a small section of the motorway where they gain an advantage, so it's about one mile of the motorway. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Um, I think Councillor Sunderland, is your hand up? It is, Chair. Um, 
so given that they the, there appears to be very little impact of not being able to of not having the access via Hartshead Moor, um, there's that, that access is down a residential road. Would officers then be happy to have some restriction put onto the road um, because the residents there are, have, have clearly um, felt that the only reason that there was no restriction was to allow access to the motorway for the fire brigade? Yeah, I think, um, Council, that would be a matter for the local authority. Uh, and if we were consulted on, we'd, we'd give a fair, a fair response to that. We'd have uh, limited reason to need, uh, need that access. I think I think the residents might be pleased to hear that. Thank you. Okay. Right. I don't see any other. Um, I don't see a little bit there into the ten, um, but. Um, have I have I have I understood right that when it, when the nine 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 calls into service and go through control, they don't know what point between two junctions the, the incident is. So if there's an incident between twenty six and twenty five, generally a fire clients would need to enter at chain bar because yeah, so they run the risk of having to come back on themselves because they may if they join the M sixty two too far on, then the incident could well be behind them somewhere on the carriageway. That's correct, Chair. Yeah. I think one of the, the, the few benefits of the managed motorway network uh, is that it's monitored very closely by highways, so we do get a, a very good, accurate sort of like understanding of where uh, the incidents occurred and where we need to access. Uh, clearly, it is difficult on a stretch of motorway if we just receive the call from the, uh, the people in the collision, so they, they struggle to accurately pinpoint themselves. So our, our operational procedure is to enter at a junction and, and run the entire length of that the entire section of that motorway to make sure that, as you suggested, we don't miss it. Uh, there is a risk coming on at Hart said that they may have already come on past the incident. It could be actually eastbound of the, the section where they get on. So, yeah, we, we, we do have quite tight procedures and work closely with the uh, police and highways to make sure we do access the correct section. Okay. And some of the statistics that are in there around response times. How, how do you come to those kind of statistics? What's the, what's the methodology of that? Yeah, yeah, so we have a, a, a very substantial uh, data uh, base that we, we uh, start by mapping the, the road networks um, using the integrated transport network. Uh, and that's a really substantial uh, road network where the, the entire sort of road network is broken down into 500 metre sections. Uh, there's nodes along those. What we then do is we, we monitor our, our performance. So all our blue light runs are tracked uh, through automatic vehicle location. That all goes into a big database. And we then uh, look at the, the time it's taken for us to travel between every, every node on that road network. And that's across the county. So we build our own database over time uh, to get a real life understanding of our performance against space planning assumptions. So we're quite confident with that. Uh, we've had that work assured and reported to the fire authority on a couple of occasions now. And um, Scott, who, who, Airman Scott Landerman, who monitors our performance against our space plan assumptions, you'll see that we're at the high 90s, 96% on average, our overall performance. And that's because we have a lot of confidence in the data. Uh, it's our own data set that we maintain regarding actual responses like responses along that road network. Okay, uh, I don't see anybody else uh, put their hand up or comment in. But if I could just sum up and say, I think I think as we take confidence in the uh, success of say of the consult, um, if not the best in terms of responses and best and one of the best features we've had. Particularly pleased to see uh, the numbers of people that engaged. Uh, Facebook live sessions. Uh, I know I looked at some of those myself. Um, and it was great to see so many people say they clicked in and, and watching that, and many of them commenting as well. Uh, I did meet all the watchers um, down at Clegg Eaton and had a discussion with Microsoft Teams around this proposal. Uh, discussions with the FBU, obviously with senior officers, 
Um, and I'm pleased that we were able to have that meeting with the three ward councillors um, as well back in back in July about this. Um, so, yeah, generally very pleased with the outcome of that consultation. So thank you for doing that again under difficult circumstances. Um, is there anything that you want to add now as we go to item number 10 now that we've dealt with the consultation part of the proposal? Yeah, I think Councillor Sunderland may have another question. Yeah, sorry, I've just seen it. Yeah, Councillor Sunderland, is this on? It was on the consultation. So the last time it came before members, um, I asked about the traffic impact assessment um, and whether or not we'd done that um, and particularly whether or not we'd taken into consideration some quite substantial development that was planned for the area. Um, and the answer was, no, you hadn't. Um, I can't find it. So has that yet been done? So in, in terms of the traffic impact assessment, what we, we carry out, Councillor, is a, uh, an assessment of our response uh, times into low, lower super output areas. So as you're aware, we profile risk of fire across the county based on low super output areas. So we look at, uh, given the two locations, what, how can we, uh, what time will it take us to respond into those areas should we have an incident? Um, as I say, that, that work is built on the database that I referred to earlier, uh, that's built up over time, uh, and it's built on real um, blue light responses. So we have done that assessment to understand um, what the impact will be in terms of response. I think the other, it's a traffic assessment in terms of uh, changes in traffic flow due to the nature of that station. It's going to be very marginal. It's not like a major service uh, hospital or a school that's being built in an area. Uh, to put it into context, like you can go to between 850 and 900 incidents a year. Uh, so it's quite a small uh, amount of traffic flowing in and around the local community. Um, so yeah, that's how we how we build that. I think in terms of the um, uh, new developments, we do take those uh, into consideration and we do look at local development plans. I think what we explained last time is that we find that new houses, because they're built uh, to new standards, new wiring, new smoke alarms, uh, fire doors that fit properly into the frame, compartmentation, that's right, they are lower risk in a low risk environment for people to live. So we tend to find that we don't have the same uh, level of incidents and severity of incidents in those uh, in those new, new towns. So it doesn't massively impact on our risk profile. Uh, as you, you may imagine, we don't sort of see a massive increase in demand for the new housing estate project. I think what I was asking for was an actual report, because you will have to produce one at planning, um, and this is um, to actually take into account and see on a piece of paper that somebody has done the work on the traffic impact assessment. Yeah, well, well if, if at this point, if you haven't done it, that you you know um, that it's just a, a, a verbal update. Yeah, so if, if approved, uh, Council, we do work with planning consultants uh, to look at the, the actual proposal to build the fire station and, and the considerations we need to take into account to get planning consent. So they, we don't engage in that process until we've got consent from the fire authority uh, to progress to that stage. But it was a specific request at the last meeting. Thank you. Yeah, if I can just come in there, I've got a couple of people. I think we take confidence with the that for purposes of obviously this is this this what, what, what we're not backing on here is the planning application but what we do see in front of us is those response times to the high the medium the low super out areas which is you know this stage of an irmp the language and the report such that, that we use this stage um so i take confidence in the fact that we do have those response times noted to those, to those areas um because that's what we're about isn't it it's about how long will it take us to get to various neighbourhoods and low uh, super output areas? And that, I just want to give people confidence that information is indeed there. If something comes at a later date that is required by planning, of course, we will, you know, we will undertake our statutory duties there also. Um, Councillor Hall. Thank you, Chair. Um, have we got to item 10? It's really coming to item 10. Yeah, can I just come in, Nick? Are you, we, we, we have 
obviously it was almost expected, but we have sort of crossed over a little bit from consultation yeah. to uh, what is becoming the final proposal. Have you got anything to add, Nick, before? No, no. no. Do you want to just, because there are people asking, wanting to ask questions about items, do you want to just summarise for us um, what the final proposal is before we go to questions? Yeah, so, um, so the, the proposal uh, is as presented last time, uh, Chair. Um, so uh, the proposal to relocate the fire station that's currently based on High Time Road in Cleckington uh, to our fire service headquarters site in Birkinshaw. Um, so it's for decision today and we recommend uh, that the fire authority approve that. Uh, the key points of the proposal is Cleckington is at one of our oldest stations in the estate. Uh, it's beyond a uh, refurbishment, so we've had a, an independent assessment done and it requires a, a rebuild, which would require significant investment. As part of that, we've reviewed its location and we feel it would be better served uh, if it was based at, at headquarters in terms of uh, response to risk across West Yorkshire. As I've already suggested, it will maintain the two appliances that are currently located out of Cleckington. So there'll be no impact on the number of appliances or capabilities. There'll be no impact on the, the staff uh, working there. They will all transfer to the, the new site. Um, we'll see an improved response to some very high and high risk areas of the county. Um, all those that see a, a, an increase in their response time will continue to receive a response that's in line with the response received elsewhere in West Yorkshire. So all the things that there will be continuing to get a fire engine within the uh, risk-based plan assumptions that the authority has approved. As we've discussed, it achieves best value, so it does save a significant amount of funding if we were to build it because we'll be uh, developing and enhancing uh, some facilities that are already based at headquarters, which house the urban search and rescue capability. So that's the capability that Clucky currently deliver. Uh, and they spend their time split between headquarters and Clackheaton. So we feel bringing it all together at headquarters will improve uh, their training and their facilities to deliver that capability as well. Uh, so all in all, we feel it's a more efficient and effective uh, delivery of the service. Uh, and it's again open for, for questions, Chair. Okay, thank you. At this point, then I'll bring in Councillor Hall. Thank you, Chair. Um, just just on the money on the money side of this in the finances um it, it would have been remiss if officers hadn't brought this to our attention in in that they have seen an opportunity for what they say is an efficiency and they've brought it and they've brought it up now i have no problem with that because officers would be negligent if they didn't uh, bring to our attention where they think things can be delivered more efficiency so i have no problem with that side of it where i do have uh, some reservations and particularly in conversations I've had with some of my residents at the southern end of the Spurn Valley, so this is Robert Town and Hartshead in particular, um, is their nervousness as, as to being moved further away from the station in effect. Um, could, could officers perhaps um, confirm to me where the Robert Town and Hartshead area would be served from in, in terms of response? We do have a small retained station, I know, at Murfield. Um, that's the first question. Uh, and, and the second is a concern, really, which is generally about the state of the roads in this area. It wasn't too long ago that a report said that the A62 was the most congested road in the county. That might have changed now, but I'm sure it hasn't changed a lot. It is, it's a very bad road, and particularly uh, where we do have some kind of occurrence on the motorway, the whole area of the Spen Valley just becomes totally congested and, and you can't move and this is driving a lot of local concern uh, in the Spen Valley area about, about the moving of, of the fire station so I wonder whether I could perhaps have just an answer to, to those please. Yeah okay Councillor so the areas you refer to um, we'll, we'll right, right to see a change in there that might be a bit of concern. I think it's, it's fair to say that uh, in terms of our modelling of the risks they are very low risk areas um, and we can give them assurance that they will continue to receive a fire appliance within the approved response standard for a very low risk area. Uh, in terms of where that fire engine will come from, if it's approved, it will come uh, from Birkinshaw 
uh, have options to go right back into the or through the uh, into that into that area. But also be supported by Dewsbury and as you pointed out, Murfield. I think one of the benefits of, of fire cover, is, as councillors are aware, it's a network of fire cover uh, that, that, that creates a, a mesh across the county. And when we get incidents, for instance, if it's a house fire with people reported in, inside, we send three fire engines. So in essence, we're going to be getting fire engines coming from different directions, which then minimises the impact on uh, of traffic disruption in the area as well. Um, so that the fire cover continues to be very good in and around this area of West Yorkshire if the change was approved. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Graham, uh, you had your hand up. I'm not sure if it's there anymore. Do you want to come in, Councillor Graham? I've heard enough, Chair. Yeah. Okay. Um, Councillor Sutherland. Complex switching stuff off and on all the time. Sorry, Chair. Okay. Um, I can feel that we're coming to the end of the discussion, really, um, and, and about to make a decision. So I do want to propose that we actually defer this decision. Um, I know whenever you do this sort of work, there's always winners and losers. Um, whenever you close a, a fire station or you move a fire station. But I think to be fair to everyone, um, we really ought to have seen a, a full traffic impact assessment. Um, it's it, it was asked for quite some while ago. Um, and I, I don't think it's a satisfactory answer to say, well, we've got some old, we've got some historical data and we, we carry on updating that. And when we build new houses, they build them to a better standard. Um, I think possibly most councillors on that committee would actually contest that proposition that all new houses are built to a, a better standard. So I'm disappointed that we haven't been fair to all communities and, and that we haven't done that traffic impact assessment for so that everybody can see that we have actually looked at um, most historical data, what's on the ground now. And, and importantly, you know, when you've got heavily congested roads and heavily congested motorways, that we have actually looked at uh, future developments. So I move that we defer it today. Thank you. Okay. Um, I am actually uh, just to make a comment. Um, I've noticed on the chat that um, Councillor Jenkins has moved the recommendation. Councillor Lynch already seconded that. Um, if I just make a comment, that first of all, I think we're, we're, we're clear in the fact that, you know, yes, conditions. Um, back in my ward, Dewsbury West, we closed Dewsbury Fire Station, closed Batley, and we're doing the one site on Bradford Road. We've seen similar things in Leeds where Gipton and Stanks were closed and moved into Killingbeck. Similar around the area, there's been this change in picture of risk over the last few years, this change in financial picture over the last few years. To make a decision based on being authority members, uh, to put the service in the best position uh, for the future, for the next 30, 40 years. Um, I'm confident with the state and the school consultation given the fact that it's the best that we've we've ever had um i think you know yeah there may well be some new housing developments cropping up in fleck eaton but i would imagine that you could say the same for other walls hq nearby um more outlying areas as well um, but what's important as an authority is to know the response times you know with a blue light service um we get to instance from the, within agreed protocol of, of, of attendance times and I'm happy with the data that shows us that we still are able to do that. Um, if we weren't under blue light then there might be a different story. If we are a blue light service, if we can get to those incidents as I described and those agreed target times then, then I take confidence in that. Um, so so with that I um I we accept the proposal to relocate like a fire station up to HQ. Um, 
Does anyone want to second that? I'll second that proposal. Yeah, Councilman. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I understand you were you were speaking there. I didn't hear anybody second uh, your motion. Um, so I'm happy to change yeah. my vote on the uh, on, on that move and second it. Chair, may, may, I, may I speak, please, Councillor Hall? Oh, sorry, Councillor Hall. Yeah, well, I would, I would be, I would be happy to uh, to second Councillor Sunderland's move up for deferral. Okay. Um, I first of all move, and we've had a second it on the county motion. Um, Ian, do you want to give a bit of advice? Chair, Chair I think. Yeah. Sorry, just sorry, Ian. I don't think there's a there's, there's a reason to, do, to defer this. I think we have all the information that we need. Um, if people want to take a vote on a deferral, um, then, then we could do a vote on that. Um, I, as chair, I don't I, I don't really feel we need that, and that's not. That's not something I can support, and my group can support. So I think we have the information that we need. It's good quality information. It's, it's wide range of information as well. Um, so I think we're in the best place that we can be to make this decision. It's quite a compelling argument, and we've, we've discussed it at length. Um, now I'm happy if people want to take a vote and they want to defer. Is that what you're asking for? Is that what's been moved and seconded? It is what's been moved and seconded, yes. Uh, would you would you would you at this stage like to take a recorded vote on Councillor Sunderland's proposal? Yeah, we'd we'll like to take a recorded vote on that please. Um those yeah. against yeah. deferral. Chair if, if I if I just take you through this then uh, so that everybody's clear. Um Members have been asked to vote on an amendment to the original proposal, which is to defer the item, which is proposed by Councillor Sunderland and seconded by Councillor Hall. Um, what, I, what I'll do is um, I'll call out each member's name in turn. Um, I'll ask members to indicate for or against or abstain. Uh, and then, depending on the outcome of that, we'll then move on to the substantive motion if the, if the amended motion is lost. So hopefully everybody is clear on that. Um, so, uh, Councillor Actor? Abstain. Uh, Councillor Alnus? Ian, can we just, can we just, uh, are we able just to go into groups if this is, this, I think, I think we need to discuss this in groups for, for, for a moment, um, to give this time to consider what's being asked here, and I don't think we've had chance We've had, we've not had a chance to do that yet. Chair, uh, what, 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 what you are permitted to do, you, 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 can, you can adjourn the meeting for a period of time for, for the discussion, so that, that's at your behest, really, Chair. Right, okay. Chair, if the council made a mistake, I'd be happy for her to vote again. Right, can we, can you, can, if everybody just mutes their microphone, turns off their cameras, I would like to adjourn for 10 minutes. I just don't know how logistically we do that, so we can just discuss in groups. Yeah, so Chair, Chair, just to be clear, we'll reconvene at 12.15. Yeah, that's fine. As I don't get stuck out for 20 minutes, I miss my boat. <laughs> <laughs> On what link do we use to revert to groups?
Welcome everybody back to the meeting. Um, we've had a deferment moved and seconded, so we're about to take it. Show it live, yeah. Yeah, we've just got live now, so. Okay, Chair, we're live now. Yeah. So welcome back, everybody. Uh, a few technical issues there, and obviously one of the challenges of remote meetings is that you can't meet people in person to discuss items. Um, so we've had to do that very quickly. Um, there's been a mover and a seconder for a deferment of this item. It's not showing live on YouTube, even though we've been told it's live, I can't see it. There is always a, a delay. It will be live. OK, Chair. OK, so if we're live, then we'll go through the list again. And this is the, the, the move to defer. Just read the question, I'll get it. Chair, Chair, if I take it from here then, so, so members are clear, the, the item on which you're voting on now is proposal by Councillor Sunderland and seconded by Councillor Hall that the, um, the Integrated Risk Management Plan final proposal for 2021-22 be deferred. So that's the amendment to the substantive motion. If when I call out your name, you could indicate whether you're for the amendment, against the amendment, or you intend to abstain. So, Councillor Aptar. Councillor Actor. Yeah, yes. Um. Are, you, are, are you for or against the motion, sir? I'm sorry. Do you want to move on and come back, Ian? I'll come back to Councillor Actor. Councillor Almas. I am against the motion, please. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Anderson. I'm for the motion. Councillor Downs. I'm for the motion. Councillor Fenton Glynn. Uh, against. Councillor Graham. Against, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Hall. Four. Councillor Harrod. Four. Councillor Hunt. Four. Councillor Jenkins. Against. Councillor Curtin. Four. Sorry, I didn't catch that, Councillor Curtin. Could you repeat? Cool. Councillor Mohammed against Councillor O'Donovan against Councillor Pervais oh. I think she's missing the Good. Oh, got the word. Mm. Councillor Pollard. Four. Councillor Renshaw. Against. Councillor Shaheen. Against. Councillor Sunderland. Four. Councillor Tate. Against. Councillor Tully. Against. Councillor Wedham. Again. Can I go back to Councillor Akhtar? Against. Thank you. Shall I just top those up? I'm not sure Councillor Pervade heard the question. It went a bit crackly. Do you want to, could I ask that you repose that question to Councillor Pervade again? Oh. Chair, Chair, Chair. I, 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 don't, I don't think I'm permitted to do that. But okay. 
in any event, the, re the result of the vote is for the amendment, nine votes, against the amendment, 12 votes, so the amendment is lost, and we move to the substantive motion with your permission, Chair. Okay, so I'll move the substantive motion, uh, the proposal to relocate Clarkey and Fire Station to HQ site. I'll move that. Yeah, and I'll second that, Councillor Donovan. Chair, if you take, take members through this again then, so to, to be really clear, you, you're, you're voting that the IRMP proposals for 21 22 be approved. Um, so again, I'll go through the list if you can in indicate for, against, or abstention. Councillor Akhtar. For. Thank you. Councillor Almas. For. Thank you. Councillor Anderson. Abstain. Thank you. Councillor Downs. Against. Councillor Fenton Glynn. For. Thank you. Councillor Graham. Councillor Graham, I think you're on mute. Is that, is that Graham? Yes, Councillor Graham. Can you just expl explain to me what he says? Because I'm getting voice over them. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Councillor Graham, we're, we're currently voting on the IRMP proposal for 21 22. Um, the proposal from Councillor O'Donovan, O'Donovan is that. Um, the proposal is approved. Uh, so I'm asking you to vote for, against, or to abstain. I think, okay. I think you're on mute, Councillor Graham. Oh. For, the recommend for the recommendations. Thank you. Councillor Hall. Abstain. Councillor Harrod. Abstain. Councillor Hunt. Abstain. <clears throat> Councillor Jenkins. Four. Councillor Curtin. Abstain. Sorry, I didn't catch that, Councillor Curtin. Abstain. Councillor Mohammed. Four. Councillor O'Donovan. Four. Thank you. Councillor Pervais. Four. Councillor Pollard. Abstain. Councillor Renshaw. Four. Councillor Shaheen. Four. Councillor Sunderland. Against. Councillor Tate. Four. Thank you. Councillor Tully. Four. Councillor Wenham. Four. Thank you. One, two. <coughs> Chair, the motion is carried by 13 votes to two. Okay. Thank you, members. Thank you for your time and thank you, officers. Thank you to the public for being this. Uh, yes. In a real live human meeting, that would have been uh, much easier to get through. Uh, but when people, um, it's quite normal to have to, you know, discuss amendments as they come. Um, uh, direction. Um, so yeah, public confidence in that in that decision. Um, it provides us with a better risk cover. Um, it allows us to allow our firefighters and staff to meet the needs of the future. Um, it, it balances and improves our ability to, to tackle risk in the area, which, is, which has changed and, and, and will likely change. And we are able to deliver our services at the highest risk of areas, uh, which this proposal does. It offers better value for money for the public. Uh, in terms of for our staff, it provides a much more modern, future-proof uh, facility than what could be delivered uh, on the Clarkeaton site. So I'll move on to item number 11. Um, this is the external appraisal of the 
this integrated risk management model, page 125. I'll ask that you keep it brief. I'm wary that the meeting will run a little bit, uh, but if you want to take us to right to number 11. Thank you, Chair. I'll take that. So the purpose of the report is for members to note the appraisal conducted by Operation Research and Health, or ORH, a consultancy company used to assure West Yorkshire's integrated risk management model. Members be aware that they, the model was developed, uh, which supports and underpins our approach to an understanding of risk to ensure we effectively protect the people of West Yorkshire. So the methodology model uh, has been refined over the time and it's been developed over using station grounds to measure risk uh, over to ward areas and ultimately low super output areas. Uh, the fundamental part, fundamental part of the integrated risk management model is the use of deprivation to determine the relative risk of fire, which in practical terms means the least deprived areas have lower numbers of fire related incidents than the more deprived. Uh, the approach was presented to and approved by the Fire Authority uh, as the model to support the IRMP on the 21st of February. To further enhance that integrity of the integrated risk management model, we're sure to engage with the external consultant, ORH. Uh, ORH, for members' awareness, is a external consultancy company that uses or, and is used by emergency services around the world to optimise and effect, efficiently and effectively attribute risk. So it was based on three significant areas, which is a technical assessment, we can confirm that ORH uh, have no concerns over the technical validity of the IRNM. Uh, methodology review, ORH applied that um, West Yorkshire's model regionally and nationally against all fire rescue services data, which determine the benchmark and demonstrate that the relationship shown within West Yorkshire is true elsewhere, thus adding a uh, weight to our approach. The body of the paper uh, provides members with a summary of the technical detail of the report, which I'm happy to provide members with further details if required. Uh, but to summarise, all the areas were deemed appropriate and benchmarked against other fire rescue services. Uh, it's also interesting to note that the financial implications section, particularly consultation appraisal, was uh, reduced by ORH um, as they intend to apply elements of our IRM within their future modelling systems. Um, to conclude, the appraisal provides members with assurance and confidence that the authority approved integrated risk management model uh, is robust and can, be con and can be trusted to inform the IRMP moving forward. Happy to take any questions, Chair. Uh, questions, yeah. Can I was that? that key? You broke up there, Councillor Donovan. Excuse my sound. Yeah, just bring you in, Councillor Pollard. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, just one very brief one, really. On page 127, um, uh, the, uh, the first paragraph on that page, uh, a slight query from ORH regarding the appropriateness of considering density of occurrences of fires rather than the deprivation factor. Uh, obviously, I guess with the experience in other areas this summer, uh, of the hazards of applying mathematical algorithms to policy. Um, are there any outliers that we know of in the deprivation stroke historical incidence correlation? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that question, Councillor Pollard. So when we've done the modelling, one of the, the benefits of using this approach is that we can identify the outliers. Uh, and that enables to understand um, why, from a, a risk perspective, they're performing better than uh, they, we, we would expect them to do. Um, so that's a piece of work that uh, Aaron Antidonovan is doing uh, through his prevention strategies to, to look at those outliers to understand uh, what the reason for that is. I think the, the main benefit why we moved away from sort of like the density of incidents, which was part of our previous model, uh, is because that allows um, spikes in incidents in very low risk areas to skew uh, the map. And if you remember, uh, going back to Weatherby, um, because of the, uh, the Young Offenders Institute there, we were seeing that as a very high risk area of West Yorkshire, and we knew that specifically it wasn't. Likewise, we had uh, individual 
what I'm building fire in a certain area because of the nature of that, it, it presented that area then to be very high risk. Um, so actually this model uh, prevents those outliers skewing the overall underlying risk modeling that we're doing, uh, but we do use that for further evaluation. And I'm sure when when uh, everyone's around is ready, we'll report some of that back to the Drew and Safety Committee so I'll understand uh, some of that work. Yeah. Yes, I can, I can see obviously that the Weatherby situation was a manifest outlier. I was just wondering if there were any others essentially. Yeah, yes, and, and there are, and uh, that's, that's, as I said, the benefit of it. We can understand why uh, they are that way. So, for instance, in, in some of the Wakefield area, we do understand that uh, given the level of deprivation they do uh, experience, the level of incidents, uh, the best of what you should do. Um, so we can have a real deep dive into those local areas and just see what is different within them. Um, so it's, it does provide uh, us with a, a model where we can do real detailed evaluation, and that's one of the reasons why we introduced it. That's fine, thank you. Thank you. Uh, don't see anybody else chat there so i'll just say thank you yeah it's just a note thank you for doing that i think it's important that there is that obvious correlation between deprivation and fire uh, poor housing quality uh etc all the properties so i think uh take confidence with the fact that the model with which we uh, have been using for our IRMB, uh models is is secure and sound and fit for us really so thank you for that. Um, and then final item, item number 12, just a brief uh, update. Good morning, Chair. Councillors, thank you. I will keep this brief. I do appreciate you've been here a long time. So this report is for noting and it provides an update on the gap analysis that we've undertaken following the Grenfell Tower Phase 1 report. Um, moving on to page 132 between sections uh, 2.1 and 2.4, that provides some of the detail, and it is brief detail, and I do accept that, um, of what some of the programmes and things that we have already done. Whilst this report does look like these are things that have been done in a relatively short period of time, some of this work has been ongoing literally from the day after um, the Grenfell report, so it has been ongoing for over three years. And a lot of the work is about refining some of the things that we have previously put in place, um, improving the ways that we do some of those things. So I am going to touch on any of those in particular. I will allow our questions shortly. Um, from sections 2.5 through to 2.10, that provides a brief overview of the number of buildings that we have within West Yorkshire with unsafe external wall systems. Um, and that, again, if anybody has any questions, I'm more, more than happy to talk about those. Moving into sections 2.11 through to 2.13, that provides an update with regards to the uh, Fire Protection Assurance Board uh, that we are undertaking, or we, and we have previously been undertaking. Moving a little further into the report, I talked through some of the recent legislative changes. And then uh, moving on to sections 2.18 to 2.20, that talks about the phase two uh, proceedings of the Grenfell inquiry. Section three provides an update on some of the financial implications um, around some of the purchases that we have already made or will shortly be making. Um, I, and then moving towards the end from page 139 onwards, that provides um, some of the areas within the Grenfell action plan that we are now following. Again, I'm not going to go into detail on any of those, but if anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to take those on any part of the report. Thank you. I've got a bit of a list. Uh, first on list was Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Chair. I know this is about the Grenfell inquiry, but having um, the Manchester inquiry into the arena bombings just started, and I just wanted to make sure that we were looking into that and making sure if there's any lessons to be learned that come out of that, that I'm, I'm sure the officers will be doing that. Thank you. Yes, just in reply to that, I can confirm that uh, the Manchester arena um, inquiry, we will consider all things that are coming out of there. And similarly, we've recently received the report from Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service on the Q fire from Bolton um, back in November 2019. And again, all the areas within that report 
have been assimilated into our own action plan and anything that is different or was outside of the current Grenfell actions have been added and will become part of our plan moving forwards. Thank you. Uh, go to Councillor Jenkins. Hi, yes. Um, so I've, I'm quite concerned about um, Grenfell and Essentially, I would like us to be able to discuss it in more detail at the next Community Safety Committee in October, um, because having 550 buildings to be inspected by the end of 2021 across West Yorkshire is of concern. And also of concern is that the government voted against um, the Building Safety Bill um, amendment that was put forward by Labour um, to implement phase one. So that's a, a great concern. And I think I would like to ask if we could have the fire officers from each authority, um, particularly re with regard to housing, um, to give their view to the Community Safety Committee or can join in the meeting. I think joining in on a, a Microsoft Teams meeting is quite probably quite difficult. I much prefer Zoom. But still, I think if we get some views from the, the local uh, authorities, it would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Don't come in there. Please, Chair. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, from my point of view, I'm more than happy to reach out to the local authorities and see if they will be willing to uh, take part in um, an updated meeting. Uh, for your own understanding, we do meet with the local authorities and the large social housing providers that own or manage the, the vast majority of those 550 properties. We meet with them approximately every six to eight weeks, and we are working hand in hand to ensure that the updates that we are wanting or we are trying to uh, move forward, particularly around some of the legislative changes, are happening um, at the same time. So we are already working very closely with them, but if that's something that we can facilitate moving forward and bring to another meeting, I'm more than happy to try to do that. Thank you. Um, I'll go to Councillor Hall. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the The action plan at the end is, is, is really extensive, and, and of course it has to be. But when I was looking down the financial, financial implications, the cost of secondment, it runs at £12,000 an annum. And it struck me that that wasn't a very high figure given the amount of work we're expected. And I wondered whether that needs to be resourced better or whether we've set that at the right, uh, at the right level. Yes, so just uh, obviously for your own understanding, um, the £12,000 currently covers the cost for two roles, that's uh, myself and uh, one other officer seconded into this, and that's partly because um, that's an additional cost over and above what is already accepted within the organisation. However, we have been clear uh, within uh, the whole project that there will be times where we do need additional resources. That is available to be had from other parts of the organisation, Currently, as it stands, we are using sort of current resources within there rather than pulling them directly into the team. However, we are looking at what other options are moving forward, particularly around the training aspects and whether we do need to increase the size of the team. If that is the case, then some of those costs will change. That's good to know. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll go to Councillor Pollard. Maybe not, maybe not, not me. No, sorry, uh, Councillor Wenham. Um, on page 143, 7.5, 7.6, .5, page 144, 9.3, page 145, 1, 11.3, are these all? They say they're supposed to start in September. Are they all started? The training has already been started. Let me just confirm each one of those, if you don't mind. Yeah. 
Yes, yeah, so um, that policy will actually be released um, in about 10 days' time. So on the 28th of September, the policy will uh, be released to all our staff. The people that need to be up to speed and trained prior to that policy being released will have been trained at that point in time, hence the go-live date. Uh, then additional training will be provided to the entire of our operational staff from that date moving forward, and those training dates are already planned in. Right, thank you. Thank you. I'll go to Councillor Rachel. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to ask, referring back to page 134, where it mentions the 11,000 buildings, um, 350 of those are in Leeds. I'm just wondering what percentage of those or how many of those are private uh, buildings and what work is being done already to address those 350? obviously unsafe buildings within our city. So just to confirm on that, um, the uh, Leeds City Council have uh, 116 high-rise buildings within Leeds District, so roughly speaking that means there are approximately 235 private buildings within um, Leeds District. From a point of view of safe or how safe or unsafe some of those are. Now, clearly what we are not saying is that the vast majority of those buildings don't have unsafe cladding on the outside of them and things like that. So obviously some of the 50 or so buildings within West Yorkshire clearly are in Leeds and are part of that 350, but there is uh, not all of that 350 are by any means unsafe buildings due to the type of cladding on them. Have we been and visited? The vast majority of those buildings, absolutely yes. Do we intend to visit them all again? Definitely yes. Thank you, Chair. It's just for... Is that okay, Councillor Rachel? If appropriate, that private owners are being made to take the appropriate action too. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'll go to Councillor Harrand. Thanks, Chair. I just want to support Councillor Jenkins' proposal that this goes to community safety. This, many of the actions, in the word commas, in this paper uh, just started or are not yet started three years after the event. Now, if I were Chair of Community Safety, I have this on the agenda every time. And, and I definitely support that it goes there next time. And if not, can we have on to the next meeting of the, of the full authority? He's arguably the most important subject that we're talking about this morning. And uh, to get occasional reports with promises for work that's about to start three years after the event would be better. Yeah, can I comment that, please? Can you, yeah, can, can you just clarify that? Because this, 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 I think there's been a misunderstanding here. This isn't an inaction from the last three years. There was a, there was a, uh, a plan three years ago that's been put in place. This is something new, isn't it? Do you want to just clarify that what that is? Yeah, just just to kind of cover uh, Councillor Hallen's concerns and those echoed by Councillor Jenkins. Uh, obviously, as soon as uh, the Grenfell Tower fire happened, the day after we were immediately reviewing our own situation in West Yorkshire. So work literally began the day after the, that fire. Uh, I think it will be fair to say that certainly the recommendations out of the phase one uh, public inquiry on the back of the Grenfell Tower. That that's just coming up to its one year anniversary. Uh, as part of that recommendations, there was a clear list of actions for uh, Home Office, uh, Ministry of Housing and uh, Communities and Local Governments, uh, and out of that, uh, down to individual fire and rescue services, some very specific actions for London Fire Brigade, and then also, uh, as you'll be aware, local authorities and build known as responsible persons as well. So there was a whole raft of actions that uh, were, were released just short of a year ago now. So the action plan based on uh, from where we were three years ago to where we are now has grown. Uh, we've done an awful lot of work, uh, certainly Dave and, and his, his small team and collectively through service delivery. I don't want members to be under the impression that we're only just starting this now uh, because we've done an awful lot of work since then and arguably we are 
I would say a lot ahead of the curve in terms of a lot of those fire and rescue services. So I just want to give members that reassurance and certainly we can bring it back to Community Safety Committee uh, for further discussion and reassurance to members as part of the work that we're doing. Okay, thank you. Chief, I can go through with you. Yeah, I understand that. I won't try to apply the tech, nothing had started yet, but there are many, but there are several things in this report that say the updated evacuation guides will be released in September 2020. Now, you might like to tell community safety once a quarter or how often that, that we're making progress and uh, everything's on track. Because there are a lot to be things which an outsider thought might, might uh, have been complete by now. Yeah, I understand that, Councillor Haddon, and we can certainly uh, bring more information and debate to the Community Safety Committee as part of that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Graham. I have a couple of. I have a couple of points, Chairman, uh, to John. Right, Re responsible persons. That's the first point. What progress has been made on on that? And the second one is that I pre press your laminate. Where are we now with that with that uh, report? It's a bloody yeah. awful, awful phone. Is this? Is this? You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, Chair. If I can, uh, if I could bring Chris Kemp in at this stage, just from a uh, actions that the authority have taken with uh, the responsible persons, certainly for buildings which have got dangerous cladding on them. So just bring Chris Kemp in to give an update on that. Okay. Cheers, John. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, in, in relation to responsible persons, um, I mean, we've got, as, as the report says, we've got um, a number of buildings that have got uh, unsafe external wall um, systems. Um, we under our safety legislation, we have utilised um, uh, Article 27 to, to reach out to those responsible people to ensure that they are actually um, putting plans in place for remediation. Um, but there's a much bigger piece of work that's been going on um, within government and the Home Office. Um, I had a call last week actually looking at um, the development of the fire safety order and the changes that are going to be made. Um, and significantly, there's a, a piece of work in there that looks at making it easier for fine rescue services to, to identify the responsible persons, because a lot of our time and effort is, is spent trying to actually identify who the responsible person is uh, and who the duty holders are. Um, and one of the changes to the legislation will be that um, responsible persons must have a registered British address um, with contact details and a contact person within the UK. Um, and that will make things moving forward a lot, lot easier for fire and rescue services to contact uh, the responsible persons. Um, some other measures that are also being introduced is that uh, high rise residential buildings will have to have a building safety manager um, and they will have to meet a, a certain level of competence um, to be able to carry out that role. And they'll be our key contact, really, um, for the day to day running of the, of the premises. Sorry, what was the, the second part of that question, Councillor? Can I can I pick can I pick up on where is the training going to take place? And if we can get a contract a contract for it, it would benefit the fire service. Yes, at, at the moment, um, training providers are currently in discussion with government in terms of what what the competence requirements of the individual roles will be. Um, Clearly, that, that, that expands not just to, to, to the responsible person and building owners, but also we've got to do a piece of work for, for our inspectors to make sure that, that they're accredited and registered to the relevant standards and relevant um, criteria that's put out there by, by government. Um, certainly, moving forward, it would be an ideal scenario if we could provide the training for, for businesses to, to, to ensure that, that responsible people and building owners are competent um, but I think for the first and foremost, we've got to meet the requirements of the competence framework that's been set out for our inspectors um, to ensure that we um, are, are, are actually consistent in, in how we approach it across the UK. Thank you. Thank you. You're on mute, Chair. Councillor Hall and Councillor Jenkins, I think, have you still got your hands up from the previous question, maybe? Or if you have a question, please do come in. 
Yeah, Councilor. sorry, Chair. I'll take my hand down. Okay, Councillor Jenkins. Yeah, sorry, I took my hand. I've taken it down. Thank you. No worries. That's fine. Yes, thank you for that update. Uh, Councillor Wenham, is yours, sorry, is yours an old hand? No, I want to ask a question. Sorry. Go ahead, Councillor Wenham. Um, on page 134.28, it's talking about the cladding. Have you all got a time scale when the cladding will be removed? Uh, Chair, Chair, I'll uh, bring Chris back in. He just covered part of that in his answer regarding the Article 27 letters that the authority sent out. Uh, but Chris will just be able to give maybe a little bit more detail to answer the Councillor Wenham's question. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, yeah, in, in terms of those those buildings that, that we initially wrote to, that was um, back in December last year. Um, we did receive responses from all, all, all the responsible people providing us with um, uh, a time frame of each individual premises. Um, and what the remediation would look like. Now, clearly, depending on the amount of cladding, the size of the building and the layout um, depends and, and the scope of the works really does have a massive impact in terms of the time frames for that remediation. Um, but if a councillor wants uh, some specific details in relation to specific buildings and their individual time scales, uh, more than happy to provide that um, after the meeting. Thank you, that will be fine. Thank you very much. I would like that information. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Okay, thanks everybody. Yeah, thank you for the update. Uh, I think, again, you know, things haven't slowed down. We, we, we're three years beyond this and there's still lots of work to do. The government is still, you know, seeking further information from us, which puts pressure on us uh, to manage all the responsibilities that we do have while still you know, um, supplying information to government around around some of these buildings. What's really needed here, what we know is that the, the pot of money from government is nowhere near enough to cover replacement and remediation of all these clad buildings around the country. And that's why, in particularly in Leeds, we still see uh, at-risk buildings in private ownership with no remediation to remove that cladding. Uh, and that's what we really need. Um, you know, Hillary Benn's been in Parliament you know, taking the fight forwards for these leaseholders have been footed with bills of thousands. Um, and what we really need is, is, is remediation funds from the government to be boosted. And uh, really, we need these uh, leaseholders to be recompensed as well, I think, on the money they've had to pay out to keep themselves safe, and, and rightly so, to keep themselves safe. But if ever there was a time for them to give more money to this, it, it, it's right now, really. Um, so, we're, we're over time as, as, as expected, um, but I'll thank everybody for their time and their patience. And I wish you all a good afternoon, and I will officially close the meeting and we can close the live feed. Thank you.